Hey everyone, welcome to the next Chebcast. This time we're talking about Warhammer, and we're here with Jinx. Hello there. And hopefully It's Ghost UK will show up. He's not here yet, but he's probably slept in or something, even though it's 4pm in the UK. Pretty sleeper, apparently. (laughs) Okay, so... We're going to be going over the necromancy in Warhammer, basically, and my knowledge on Warhammer is a little bit limited because I've basically just got five books to go off of what I've read. So I've read The the Rise of Nagash, which is like three books. I've read The Vampire Wars, which I believe is a compilation of many books, but for me it's just one book. And I've read Rulers of the Dead, which is about Nagash as a god, pretty much. And it goes into detail about Arkhan the Black and Neferata. So I think a good point to begin with with this is with the origins of necromancy in the Warhammer universe. And unless I'm mistaken, Nagash was the first necromancer. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Nagash was the very first necromancer. Um, there was look into death magic with the Tomb Kings in general, but for actually raising the dead, uh, he was the first. All right, I'm here. Sorry about being late. Hello. No problem. Welcome. Um, I will need to disappear in a bit because uh, I've got food in the oven. Oh, yeah, no worries. So we're just talking about the origins of necromancy mm. in Warhammer. Uh, came from the vampires, right? Actually, Gosh, the vampires came from the hen. Yeah. So what happened is, is that and this is spoilers during the rise of Nagash, by the way. Um, basically, Nagash finds some prisoners, some dark elf prisoners, and these mm-hmm. dark elf prisoners teach him black magic or whatever. And he somehow uses that to do the first necromancy. I don't really understand how it was never done before. By the way, there's some crazy, like, static sound coming from your mic there, Reiner. Oh, it's my fan, because it's, uh, cause climate change is making things so much hotter. Damn. Okay. <laughs> I think that the reason why necromancy hadn't been done before that point is Nehekana was one of the first human settlements uh, in general. I think uh. they were before any of the others. And at the time, um, their focus was on staying alive forever. That was kind of what their big thing was ever since Setra placed them on that path. But before that, the only like, for kind of magics that were really used were the elves who view necromancy as a sort of gross thing meant for lesser races because they're elves, of course. And yeah. Slan, who uh they didn't really want necromancy because they are all about sort of light magic and geomantic magic and things like that. Um, So they didn't really need necromancy. It's only once uh, Nagash sort of placed his ambition for living forever and also wanted to utilize that kind of magic to create an army uh, rather than people who just hate him in general. uh, That's when he decided to raise the dead and that's how necromancy first came about. Yeah. Um, The next thing I want to talk about in Warhammer with regards to necromancy is how blood seems to fuel everything. Like, Nagash was always drinking blood and so were his, like, underlings and stuff. It seemed like blood fuels most of the magic. But that's not the case later on in time, I believe. Or is it it still the case? It might have just been from advancements in... Uh, magical studies, I guess. Like, you, you know how in the real world how you have technology and then technology advances to make old versions outdated. So yeah. it, might just, it just might have just been the case that because Nehekara was so ancient, that's how they did their magic. But as time went on, it became far easier. Like, I know that um, obviously vampires, they drink blood to gain their power and use that power to do necromancy, but yeah people just as necromancers in general in the Warhammer world don't need to do anything like that uh, they just channel the wi- oh god what the hell's the winds called winds of magic the, wind- or the winds of magic the winds of like darkness the winds yeah, of the evil there's a specific one uh, the winds I of more it's a it's a oh it's it's a 
a, a corruption of the winds of Dar, I think, and Dar is yeah, the, right. And then Dar, I think, is the one that the Dark Hells use, but it's not the same one because they oh. don't use necromancy. Guys, hey guys, what's we call this winds of magic? Well, well, who uses it? Dark Elves. Okay, so we take the word <laughs> dark and we take the K off, and, and we just call it Dar, but we use two R's instead of one. <laughs> I, I I love it. No, I just no, no, remembered happened? the reason. Sorry. It's I just the, remembered the, 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 reason, the only reason that they called it that was because they were like, oh, what do we call it? And someone was just like, duh. And someone's like, perfect. <laughs> yeah. I just re remembered the reason why they use blood, and it's because back then uh, the, the winds of magic weren't strong down in Neokara because Nagash hadn't built his Black Pyramid yet, so it was difficult to get magic um, energies or whatever, so they would take it from people, and it was basically like a lesser kind of... Um, a lesser like, kind like, of... So they take it from souls, basically. Something like that. I don't know the exact specifics of it, but just thinking back on what I read in those books ages ago that was the reason because they were trying that when they were teaching Nagash that black magic and stuff it was like difficult to get like the the energy because of where they were so they decided to use people as as the fuel and so that's why in the rise of Nagash at least before the black pyramid shows up there's like so much consumption of blood with regards to the magic so that's and why he built the black pyramid in the first place yeah it does the next thing i want to talk about is nagash's immortals because these guys are really interesting they're, they're strange they're kind of like vampires in every respect except that they don't have things and they're not like they don't have any of the weaknesses or benefits that vampires have they're kind of just strange dudes that I was gonna say, like, what are they then? So it's like, okay, so they're kind of like vampires, okay, except they don't drink blood, right? And they don't have fangs, okay? And they don't have any yeah. perks or, or weaknesses, okay? <laughs> yeah, they're not they're... vampires. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because they've they've used um, Nagash's uh, knowledge and stuff, they're like his underlings, to basically achieve immortality. And they did that through this whole consumption of blood and stuff, a special mm. elixir or whatever that Nagash would make. And all of them died. The only one that's still alive is Arkan the Black, and all the other immortals were beheaded when Nagash lost his first war. What, what a shitty elixir of immortality! <laughs> we're dead. Yeah. Jeff's talking about immortals, me. Oh, cool, this might be in Total Warhammer 3, and then they all died. Ah. Oh. <laughs> I think they're supposed to be like, well, they're kind of closest to Nagash in the aspect that they're kind of liches, except they're liches that don't have their skeletal reanimated bodies, but after Arkan died, he was reanimated, and so he's kind of one of the only liches that remains, because Warhammer doesn't actually have stereotypical fantasy liches. No, like, they tend, they tend to sort of, like, subvert the norm by, like, doing things in slightly different ways, I feel. Yeah, so they don't really have liches in general, but the Immortals are the closest that they have, and as mm -hmm. I said, there's only Arkan left and Nagash himself. Um, what I was going to say is when it comes to Nagesh, like, and when it comes to, like, sort of Nehakara and Necromancy and stuff like that, I feel like there's a very big, like, when it comes to Necromancy being there, uh, compared to, like, it, it later would come to the Empire after the Vampires brought it there and so on and so forth, with, like, uh, Heinrich Kemmler and, um, what's his name, Nathaniel Gorst. David, Herman, Herman, Herman's Gorst. Hel Hellman's Ghost. Um, <laughs> with, with them coming in like with them becoming necromancers and whatnot but I feel like there's a sort of a cultural difference because with it uh, I think I mentioned this before but with it sort of like having a inspiration from what well, I say inspiration with it taking a lot of stuff from Egypt and with Egypt in real life having a lot of sort of um, respect for the dead and a lot of stuff with dead bodies and so on and so forth like with the Empire it's the case where life is quite cheap isn't it it's Regardless of where you live, you've got beastmen in the wilds, there's chaos to the east, you've got necromancers and vampires to the south, you've got um, Scandinavians to the north, uh, you've got uh, Bretonians that uh, want to kill you for the honor, because they don't get along with you. Then you've got even more green, then you've got greenskins even further south. 
and everything else that also wants to kill you. So it's like, I feel like th there's a kind of a, th a thing there where they don't want immortality because they know that life is cheap and it's, you know, they have so many things to worry about that they just cannot strive for immortality. Whereas Nehekara has got so many tyrants and kings and so many great dynasties and so much history to it by comparison that you have these people that want immortality and they want necromancy because they've they've reached the point where they will strive towards that because you know they're really really powerful it's like it's like Cetra he says it himself Cetra rules he not serves and he wants to be a god life in the Warhammer universe is just terrible in general no wonder yeah. life is super yeah yeah. Two things of note, though, from that. Um, first, as a fun little historical fact, um, the Egyptians, the real-life Egyptians, were not actually obsessed with death. It's a common misconception. The only reason why we think that's the case is because that's the only ruins and such we've uncovered. Because uh, okay. Because they're so old. Most and they're so well preserved compared yeah. to everything else. Yeah, yeah. because, so, because every, oh, most of their stuff is so old, anything that was on the surface has pretty much been buried by the sands of time. But anything is that it was also... has been kept, and that's where most of their tombs and crypts and stuff. So that's where the... Okay, so it gives... So, okay, yeah, right. Um, I was going to say, like, you've also got the whole... I, I want to say it's a rumour, because I don't have the evidence to back it up. But you know, like, the whole thing with uh, the people around... Uh, like the pyramids stealing the um rocks and stuff off it and gradually ruining them and using the materials to build their own house and shit with i feel like if that is true because i feel like it is kind of true um but take it with a grain of salt because i don't have the evidence for it but i feel like if that is true then surely they would do the exact same with everything else they can get their hands on as well well, yeah, most of the stuff was plundered uh over yeah the years which is why most of it got ripped as and it was it would kind of make sense, especially with all of the um, all of these stuff surrounding like great tombs and crypts and these massive like uh, you know like these big burial places, like all of the curses and ghosts and things like allegedly haunting them. It makes sense that people would generally leave them alone because they do not want to you know have their face face melted off because Anubis is angry because you've you know invaded this person's tomb. Aye. Um, the second thing for going back to Warhammer, um, the actual drive for immortality and the death obsession, so the mortuary cult of Nehekara, came specifically from Setra the Imperishable and all the many other titles he had. Because after he had completed mm. all of his campaigns and reunited Nehekara together, he basically claimed, I am brilliant, I have reunited everyone, life is good, why do I not deserve to live forever? And so from there, he established the mortuary cult and all of their dealings to try and figure out how to become immortal so he specifically could be immortal. But when he died, the mortuary cult failed, and so they just basically took it upon themselves to try and discover the nature of life and death. And from there, Nagash became a bad element and became the, well, the creator of necromancy by mixing uh, Nehekaran magic with dark elves winds of dar and that's how necromancy came about essentially i was gonna yeah. i was gonna say like i'm just imagine imagine if the roles were reversed so instead you had digmar basically being um this guy this 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 guy <coughs> alleged alleged primark depending on your fan theories um this guy who basically just comes in and was like you know what humanity should be immortal i want everyone to be immortal so then after he dies the empire just becomes like especially with all the skulls on their architecture and all the, and all the skulls on their armor and stuff like imagine if the empire was just very sort of necromancy focused and you had What's... like hang... yeah What's like imagine if that happened i oh, feel like the warhammer thing they just think yeah, it's because warhammer's like it came from the 80s didn't it um, like it was around the eighties when it was first like being sort of done and whatnot. So like it's it's the case where it's it's that old where it basically still had kind of like some of the edgy cool things from way back in the day to the present. But they've I feel like they've done it in a kind of pleasant way. But basically, I feel like they got the schools to because it's cool. <laughs> okay, yeah, it could be. Let's talk I mean, about I the Black Pyramid. Ooh, yes. I don't know that much about it. Like, literally, it's. I remember sort of seeing somebody make a sort of meme reference to the Black Pyramid and Necrons, and I figured to myself, wait, so are they Necrons? Like, what? <laughs> okay, so it's pretty awesome. So, 
basically I said before there was the issue of like a lack of winds down where um, Neokara is so mm. Nagash's solution to that was to make a gigantic black pyramid to like somehow catch these winds I'm not sure how that works but there's these various structures in Warhammer I believe and they're, they're capable of like attracting these winds or whatever and basically it's like, what it's, he, it's like a magic magnet yeah and basically what he did was this he this happened after he'd basically conquered Neokara for that brief time before he lost um basically thousands upon thousands of people would like be worked to death making this black pyramid basically and all their bones and stuff would like contribute to the magic power of it so everyone that worked on this pyramid would be worked to death and then their bones would be like built into the black pyramid and then like i don't know how many lives it cost but it left the city that it, it was stationed in like pretty ruined like it was basically a ghost city at that point this amuses me a lot it's like oh it, it's just not enough it's like oh uh, and then all of the saves who work on it die oh okay and then their bones get get contributed and their souls thrust into this great big fucking furnace <laughs> and and their entire being and their entire all of their families get thrown in it like they all just fucking suffer and die for this for this big pyramid so that people can do my yeah yeah that's definitely warhammer right there you can tell yeah nagash is the most nagash is the most evil ruthless bastard ever like when i was reading that rise of nagash i was like holy shit i can't help but love this guy because he's so bad like he's like just... but what makes him evil though like what why is he the way he is like did he kick a puppy and think to himself oh this feels nice or, or was it the case where it's like somebody um stole one of it uh, stole a black lotus from him whilst they was playing mcg and ripped it in front of him and from that day onwards he was like oh i'm gonna be an evil bastard <laughs> i think he's the reason yeah uh, What's the, reason? the reason is because he so when he was born, um, he was the firstborn of the previous ruler of Nehekar. I can't remember what they called themselves. I don't think they were called pharaohs, but whatever. Um, the previous, right. the previous ruler um, of the uh, Nehekarans had Nagash as his firstborn, and as is tradition uh, with in Nehekar, the firstborn is not uh, to be in line for the throne. Instead, it's given oh. to, the firstborn is given to the mortuary cult to become a student there in order yeah. for them to learn more about it. But then. Um, the leader of Nehekar at the time had a second son, uh, Nagash's brother, who I cannot remember the name of at the moment, but I'll check later. Uh, but he, because he's the second son, was in line for the throne. So when uh, Nagash's father died, his brother inherited the throne. And this frustrated Nagash to no end, saying, I was the firstborn, I'm, I'm the big, big kahuna here, I should be the one to get the throne. And from that, yeah. his sort of resentment and anger towards his brother and those who treated him badly grew. And then he became a good student within the mortuary cult and learned all he could about him, all his magic from there, but then went a step further and started learning about things he shouldn't be knowing about, such as when yeah. Dark Elves were captured after assassinating his father, um, he learned dark magic from them and then used his necromantic knowledge from them to take the throne from his brother and did terrible, terrible things to him. So yeah, it's, oh, basically, yes. just, it's, it's basically just a giant childish, I want to be the king, but my brother is yeah. the king. Wow. I was going to say, I was, I was gonna say like, like, I, it amuses me so much, like especially with how Nagash looks. Like you just have this massive, towering skeletal monstrosity, this this being of so much power and knowledge, and it's just there going. Deed. The funniest thing I've ever heard of is the idea that Nagash always speaks in caps lock because he's just so angry and pissed about everything he does. Yeah. That's... Oh god, he's literally that. He's literally that twelve year old online that like, like you know, you know, like those people online that do like those massive paragraphs when when they um, complain about something, always in caps lock, like like screaming and shouting and like doing death threats to somebody else. It's like, oh, you you were wrong. That's him. I feel like that is so much him. That is something that he would do. Yeah. By the that's... way, the the the, the name of uh, his brother was Futep. Yeah, that's correct. He's also one of the um, 
you know how in Total War Warhammer 2 when you're buying mm. the, the dynasties Thutep is there as like an economic one I believe because ah, I he was actually good with the econ- the, with the economic stuff but Nagash resented his kind of um, his sort of soft heartedness because he, he, he believed he could rule like through like kindness and stuff like that and Nagash was always like no you're like um you're basically undoing all the work that our forefathers did because like their 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 family or whatever was like losing its sort of dominion over everything and that really like made Nagash really hateful but another thing that's really cool about him is that Nagash spurns all the gods basically like he just doesn't give a shit about them he thinks that they're crap and he wants to be a god and so like even though he's like the high priest or whatever of the mortuary cult he's basically just like wiping his ass with like the the, the holy books and whatever which is pretty unlike interesting me- and unlike well, many who see- score in the gods he actually <laughs> became a god by the end yeah. I want to I wanna say something like a bit political but I probably shouldn't <laughs> you can say it, should- I'll edit it out <laughs> Okay, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, like, um, how how dare you try? How dare you try and control the people through kindness and and through being a good person? What are you, some kind of psychopath? Said 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 the right wing. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is Nagash as a warpstone lich, because like more spoilers Ooh. here but you know how Nagash was defeated and like he's described mm-hmm. as crawling through the wilderness and like just like because he still needs to consume blood to um, fuel himself so he's like just eating creatures and like drinking their blood and whatever and he eventually like falls down a hole or something like that or gets into some kind of mine something like that I don't quite recall but in any case he comes across Warpstone and he begins to eat that to get power instead and he finds he can get a lot more power this way and look at your granddaddy escapes uh, old old age pensioners home falls down hole eats rocks yeah and when he's eating all this Warpstone it like somehow merges with him and he becomes like a sort of crystalline creature in a way like his bones get all Warpstoneified and it's really strange but kind of awesome right. How and does that work? Like, uh, Warpstone is just essentially crystallized chaos energy. I know, so, I know, but it just it feels like. See, I, 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 it's just the way that Warpstone works. It's like I try to make sense of it, but it just feels like one of those materials that it just changes depending on the plot, and that would be fine. But it's just it's like okay, so the skin we use it for their technology, and they use it for all this other stuff, right? Okay, yeah, and then the gash eats them, and then it becomes a crystal. What? Uh, it's it's essentially just again rule of cool he becomes so powerful by just consuming chaos energy that he becomes something not human at all after that and i think also because he had the only perfected elixir of immortality it means that essentially he can essentially take a lot more okay okay fair enough um, see but... this see this is what kind of like gets me because it's like in real life things don't make sense and they just don't make sense because they don't but in fantasy things have to be consistent and they have to make sense but i feel like this is one of those things where it would be discovered sooner because i can guarantee you absolutely i can fucking guarantee you that some retard in some corner of the world would see warpstone think ooh, eat it and then suddenly get and then suddenly get chernobyl radiation powers well, do keep in mind that most Warpstone is hoarded by the Skaven, and so... That is a very... Yeah, that is a fair that point, yeah. be why they don't do it. And oh, they, no. are very, they are very possessive of it. Yes. And they yeah. have eaten plenty of Warpstone themselves and horribly mutated, so I guess yeah. you just had to have that mix of the Elixir of Immortality plus the warp stone I guess it's kind of I guess it's kind of different though isn't it I guess it's I guess it's kind of like the different it's like the difference between uh, cocaine use in modern day society it's like if, if a rich person uses cocaine then you can just imagine somebody in the business suit going and, and then like going out to do some kind of big like e3 presentation but if a lower class person does it then it's somebody in like a halfway home or like this broken dilapidated house and nothing works and they've got no clothes on and they look like a skeleton and this is the difference between the Skaven and the Gash right there. Right. We should talk about Neferata because she's pretty awesome. 
Right. Isn't she the Cleopatra uh, SB reference person? She's something like that. So basically, yeah. when Nagash is defeated, Arkan is basically saved by the guy from the city in the east, which I'm trying to remember the name of. The ones with the guns. Oh, what is it? You know uh, the one I mean. Uh, the, the, is it the one on the map where they've got like blue, red, and a skull? Lamia. On Oh, I it's them, Lamia. right. Yeah, so basically, has guns? They did in the Nagash Wars. It was one of the reasons oh, right. Nagash got kicked so hard. All his um, skills. They, they made a deal with either Nippon or Cafe to get their guns, and it placed their society in a massive amount of debt to that, and that's why they suddenly had economic problems afterwards, because they essentially owed a massive amount of debt to wherever they borrowed the guns from. I think it was yeah. Cafe, actually. I love, I love how the, I love how the immortal like Lamian vampires and and undead just get fucked so hard, not by like any kind of big entity. No, they just, they just get ruined financially because they owe stuff to the Japanese. <laughs> this is before the the vampires <laughs> existed. Oh right, okay then. It, the, yeah. the vampires came about partly because they were in such troubles. Yeah, I'll explain ah. it. So basically. Arkhan the Black is brought to this city by the ruler who rescued him and he's tasked with making the elixir of immortality just like Nagash or whatever because of course those rulers want to be immortal as well and and um, Arkhan can never quite get it right like it is able to extend their life but only by like centuries or something not not permanently and Basically, what happens is Neferata wants to... Um, Neferata is, like, either the, the queen. I believe it's the queen. And she doesn't like the, the king or whatever for some reason. Like, they have differences. And the king poisons her. But for, for whatever reason, um, Arkan the Black and Neferata have, like, some kind of connection. I believe it's because she's helping him or he's, like, tutoring her. Something like that. And so he tries to rescue her from this poison. And he does all kinds of crazy black magic and whatever. And in the end, what happens is he ends up cursing her with vampirism. So vampirism arises as like the result of trying to cure someone of an incredibly deadly poison. And so Neferata becomes the first vampire. And every the vampire in Warhammer is like descended from her somehow. And with every like... Um, descent like every time new vampires are made it somehow weakened so the original vampires are the strongest ones and Neferata is of course the very strongest one and she's incredibly powerful and there's a few other like first generation vampires so like there was Neferata and then she made a whole, he whole heap of underlings and one of them was the same guy who you fight against in Total War Warhammer 2 in the bottom of the map in Neokara I've forgotten his name it's like a random vampire faction right in the middle of Neokara. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I cannot remember which one you're talking about, but I do know that the vampires that became uh, descended from Lamio essentially uh, were I'm, supposed I'm to be like the Immortals 2.0, essentially. She got a whole bunch of people to become vampires so she could essentially have them as her underlings and do her things. And a whole bunch of them had different uh, different ideas of what they wanted to do for with vampirism. Um, yeah. the, most, the most famous of the different kinds of vampires that descended from her were the Von Karstein line, which came well down the line um, which essentially are the main family that everyone knows about um, there was also the blood dragons who oh god I cannot remember the name of the guy who descended from one moment I'll check the red out. duke Please. no 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 the red duke is different he's like he was a bretonian who became a vampire and took a whole bunch of bretonian knights with him let All me right. find one second while you do that, I found the thing I was talking about. So the faction is the Necrach Vampire Faction, Necrach hey. Brotherhood, and Basoran is the guy I was talking about. He's one of the yes. original vampires that Neferata made. And he is 
uh, now descended by the last li- well, I say the last living, he's got a few other descendants of him, but the main one right now is Zacharias the Ever-Living, who is the current head of the Necrarchs, and they are the most skilled necromancers of the vampire kind, because they are most magically inclined, but they're also the most heavily mutated, uh, aside Hmm. from the Strigoi, who are just monsters. Yeah. We should talk about that, too. Abarash! The name of the blood dragon, there you go. Yes, Abarash was one of the uh, other vampires that Lamia tried to take under her wing, but he's like, he's a noble vampire, so he didn't want to kill and be mean to mortals, but he did. Yeah. And um, more about Neferata, she is a pretty sick individual. She ends up infatuated with the guy who goes on to defeat Nagash. I've forgotten his name. Um... But she ends up infatuated with him and he escapes the city and the whole time he's gone she believes that he's there hiding so she keeps like kidnapping random citizens and just like letting her um, vampire underlings just torture them even though she I don't know if she knows that they know nothing and she just wants to torture them anyway or if she's like deluded and she really thinks that they know something and they're just hiding it. In any case, the people, the vampires doing the torture know that basically the citizens don't know anything, but they just enjoy torturing them. Classic Warhammer brutality. Most brutal yeah, universe. That, that sounds like Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Suffering for suffering's sake. Um, you know these Strigoi, aren't they based on the real life um, Romanian legends of vampires? And weren't those ones basically from back when upper class no- uh, nobles and such would hunt peasants uh, for sport and whatnot? That sounds hmm. about right. Sounds right. I think I think the original vampire was um, the original vampire legend came from Vlad the Impaler because he drank the blood mm, of the yeah, Vlad Tepes the Third, wasn't it? Yes, and he and the whole bunch of rumors and stuff came about from him, and that's where the idea of a vampire came from. Well, the classic vampire. And then Bram Stoker's Dracula came out and popularized. Yeah. Yeah. And um, a little bit more about Bosorin. He um, actually tried to summon Nagash, and something went wrong with his ritual. I don't quite recall what. Do you know, Jinx? Uh, I believe what it was is his his ritual did go ahead, but when Nagash was called, he was discovered, and they stopped him because they basically said, if you summon Nagash, Nagash will just take control of us. So yeah. they did that. And the reason why it didn't work as intended was because they thought Nagash was dead, but Nagash was alive and well and was hanging out in Nagash's right. arms. And right. so because of that, they basically just informed him that vampires existed in the Hekara, which caused him to come back and take a second attempt at conquering the Hekara. Yeah, that's right. Good thing this stuff is fresh in, in, in your head. In mine, it's foggy because I've read it so long ago. Yeah, I really should have. Just trying to contribute what I can to be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's something for you. So... Kalida is someone, I believe, that Nefrata makes into a vampire. She's like a cousin. Yeah. See, doesn't she like um, get really infatuated with like a yeah with her cousin or some shit, and then she just like sort of rapes her or something along those lines and just forces her to become a vampire? Oh no, you're right. It's her cousin. My mistake. No, what it was was that it's her cousin, and she loved her cousin, but her cousin Mm. never became a vampire. Um, She. Hmm. Uh, was a good leader and was cared about by uh, by Neferata, but she never found out she was a vampire until she did, and then she challenged Neferata to a duel to the death. And right. uh, Neferata, being a vampire, was hilariously more strong, and so beat her in the in a in a one on one duel. But just as she was dying, she offered to make her a vampire so that she didn't die. So she had forcefully tried to make her a vampire, at which point uh, one of the Hekara gods, I can't remember which, 
uh, but one of them intervened, stopping the vampire's blood from mixing and turned Kalida's blood into poison, uh, which killed the vampire's blood that tried to get into the bloodstream. And then she mm. died, swore revenge upon ne- uh, Neferata, and then when she was resurrected up at the Great Tomb King Resurrection, um, she is now hunting down her cousin uh, to get revenge against her. Yeah, and she's one of the playable faction leaders in Total War Warhammer 2, I believe. Mm. Yes, as the Tomb Kings, yes. She's also they... very shit. She's like the yeah. first one. Yeah. I, like, I, Cetra's, I heard she's the best. Mate, Cetra's like the best one. <laughs> Arkan is okay. Um, Kartsep is okay, but his start is just really fucking annoying. And Kalida, she's, she's, she would be okay if she was actually good. <laughs> I heard that she has the best way to make her army incredibly powerful because she gives all of her range units an incredible boost. And for some reason, that makes her the best out of all the Tomb Kings. I might be misheard though. That might be old, old I think knowledge. It's, I think it stands for the player, because right? Because like, mm. the, thing, the thing with like Total Warhammer 2 is you're heavily incentivized to use um, mass ra- uh, archer spam and to doomstack certain units against, uh, which are typically single unit big monsters against other people against other armies so just wreck them and the tomb kings for this generally you're gonna want um what the cause like those those people like those people that do constructs and like those heroes that specialize in uh, constructs and popping them and looking after them and you're going to want buildings to get yourself constructs like the bit like the war sphinxes and the, the higher titans she also specializes in the snake constructs that i can't remember the name of yes the several cruel stalkers yes that's it. yeah um i think she's pretty cool like i actually like all the tomb king uh, leaders, I'd say Arkin's my favorite just because of the whole history behind him. Like, I just, I love the rise of Nagash and all the bad guys in it because they're, they're just so thing, fucking bad. Funny thing about Arkan is uh, Arkan's actually probably the most level headed and, dare I say it, nice of all of the Tomb King leaders or uh, faction leaders at, in the game. Primarily yeah. because his backstory is interesting for the fact that he was originally just uh, a, a sort of low-level noble who got drunk a lot and gambled a lot and liked drugs but, and didn't have a great life in that sense because he was a bit of an addict. But then yeah. uh, he was sort of bound into the service of the Nagash and then from there made his way up and sort of became a better individual. But he always suspected his master of being... Uh, a bit of an awful person and this is yeah no be, even more exemplified when so with him and neferata they actually ended up falling in love which is why he ended up saving her from dying by giving her uh the uh, ability to become a vampire so he's kind of the most redeemable of them all um and essentially once nagash died and he was resurrected and he became uh just sort of the only i suppose lich as close as you can make it left uh he became a sort of wandering mercenary for hire essentially rather than did any plans of taking over the world and stuff not that warhammer total war 2 would let you believe that because yeah in that game you just essentially i've got to resurrect nagash but that didn't really happen until much later on when it came to the end times yeah and an interesting tidbit Sorry, I'll just quickly say it. An interesting tidbit about Arkham the Black is his namesake comes from that addiction he has. He chews some kind of drug, it stains the teeth black, and that's why he's called Arkham the Black. And, interesting point, in the game Total War Warhammer 2, his teeth aren't black. This annoys me a lot. Why aren't they black? (laughs) Get a mod for it. Yeah, we need a mod for that, definitely. And um, my version is ruined! Yeah, and I was going to say that a redeeming thing for Arkan is that is he's a very he's very very loyal to Nagesh, so it's like I guess it's above all else you can kind of just sort of not really fault him for his loyalty. Well, he just wants see, to replace his master. He just wants to be loyal to him and serve him. Oh, see, the Total War games make you think he is, but if you read the books and the lore, he's actually not as loyal as you'd imagine. He never betrayed Nagash, but he never was into his whole 
want to dominate the world type deal. Yeah, he was always suspicious of like Nagash basically fucking him over and like yeah. worried about that. Total War Warhammer just kind of made him an evil lich, but didn't really give him any lead to his backstory, unfortunately. Since we're on the topic, I'd like to talk about something that happens later on to Arkhan. So when I was reading the Rulers of the Dead book, this is from when Arkhan become, um, from when Nagash is a god, basically. I believe he subjugates um, Arkhan and Neferata in like a really meaningful way to the point where they basically become extensions of himself. And I think this might be why Arkhan is so like loyal at that point. And Jinx, um, you might know more than me, but it was always described as like them being the like Arkham was Nagash's something and Neferata was Nagash's cunning. It was something like that. Um is that lore from Warhammer Fantasy or Age of Sigmar if hmm. Nagash is a god? Cause, Let me check. Yeah, because there's a big difference because um Nagash um, became a god during the end times, but he was already kind of a god uh, just the, at the start of the end times, but he's a full-blown god in Age of Sigmar, and they're two very different things. Right, that explains it. I just checked the book. It is Age of Sigmar. Yes, so um, they are... Uh, oh god, one second. Let me... Okay, hold on one second. I do know this. Do you know much about Age of Sigmar at all? Nothing. I I just know that compared to Warhammer, like the, the world of Warhammer fantasy, Age of Sigmar looks like everything is just fucked. Like everything just looks dead and barren. Uh, let me quickly check something up. And also, you've yes. got Space Marines in Age of Sigmar. Yes. Uh, let me. You guys have a conversation about something related to fantasy while I quickly check something about Age of Sigmar because I want to get this correct. Okay. So, there's one other thing. There was a guy, like, back to Neferata for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Neferata's, like, lead guy, like, the guy that was most loyal to her. Her, like, captain of the guard or something she made him into a vampire and he never wanted to, to become one and he was like really angry with this and he basically just like pissed off into the wilderness and <laughs> refused to drink blood i believe and he might be i need to fact check this of jinx but he might be the origin of the strigoi bloodline i'm not totally sure about that but he's an interesting one to talk about i've forgotten his name i'll try and look it up I'm struggling to find the term. There's only it's only a term I'm looking for before I can tell you about Age of Sigmar. Give me just a few more minutes because I need to find out what the hell the term is. No problem. I'm just trying to look up this guy's name. But he's an interesting one. If he's the origin of the Strigoi bloodline, like I suspect he might be. What was the name of the guy, sorry? I don't know. He was the captain of the guard. No, I that uh, as in Lamia's protector and the the big knight for um for Lamia uh, for uh, Neferata, correct? Yeah. No, that's the that's the head of the blood dragon. The the oh. head of the the head of the Strigoi was another noble who wanted to give more into the baseline animalistic nature of vampirism. Uh, I right. cannot remember his name though, unfortunately. But he eventually became insane, unfortunately. Um, right. And that, unfortunately, uh, caused him to essentially believe that he is a noble uh, uh, human being uh, who believes he's all fancy and and royal and stuff. But in actuality, he's he's a strigoi, so he looks like a monster. Yeah. Now that you say it, I, I do recall that. I remember, or like, sorry, okay, sorry, you, you go first. I was just saying, um, I I, I remember Nefrata describing like her f her first generation vampires as like taking on different like aspects. Like, she described that guy that you were talking about, who we don't know the name of, as like being like more and more bestial, and then like the the other ones, I don't quite recall. One of them probably right. got more and more hot. In any case, go on, Jinx. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so, uh, right, so, Age of Sigmar, 
is basically a continuation after the end times of Warhammer Fantasy. I take it you know what the end times are, correct? Yep. Yes. Okay, so, for anybody that doesn't know, basically the writers wanted to prioritize 40k over fantasy, so they just basically um, w- went left the writing room, got a stick of dynamite, threw it in the <laughs> writing room, and then with these salvaged burnt scraps, they made a story, and then they just fucking did went with it. Yes. <laughs> um, so after the end times and the world was destroyed in Warhammer Fantasy, the only survivor of the entirety of the world being destroyed was Sigmar the God and he escaped from the now fully chaos controlled fantasy world and essentially sort of wandered throughout a primordial uh i guess chaotic existence of random realms and he didn't really know what to do but then he eventually found stable enough locations that essentially decided at that point i'm going to try and rebuild the world um, and rebuild society that was destroyed in these like uh, planes of existence, um, and so he did so and brought back most of the people he could um, using his godlike powers. And one of the ones he brought back was Nagash. The reason why is because one of the realms he found was a realm called Shyish, and Shyish is basically a realm of the dead it's where all the afterlifes exist and where the various people go to when they die and he realized that in order to bring order and control to these places he needed people who he knew would be good at doing so so he found in the endless void nagash after nagash survived the end of the world by becoming a god and he essentially brought nagash back into being and decided that he would work with Nagash to take over all these realms and essentially make them uh, habitable. And Shyish was Nagash's job. And and lo and behold, he worked together with Sigmar and took control of Shyish and became the god of death, like the actual yeah. god of death, not just a necromancer when, anymore. When, when's the inevitable betrayal? So, the betrayal... How, how do you know him so well? The betrayal came this, a this, while... The thing that gets me about this isn't, isn't that Nagash is going gonna, is gonna to betray Sigmar, uh, Cole Franz, whoever the fuck, but... The thing that gets me is, not only would Sigmar revive him, but trust in him to do something. It's like, it's like if anything, it feels like Sigmar did this just to flex on Nagash and piss him off and then justify it to everyone else. Well, basically, he. It's funny thing is, Nagash did work with him for a long time, and they established the world together, and there was peace and wonder. And he controlled a realm of the dead, and he and all souls went to Nagash at the end, and all was good. But because Nagash is a random evil asshole, he decided that at one point he no longer wished to be the god of death anymore. He wanted to be the god of everything by killing everything. Because, and so there is a, there is a hint of reasoning behind it. So the, the reasoning is, at this point where he decided to betray Sigmar, because of course he did, um, Chaos started invading these new realms, and Chaos started doing their, what they do, which is mess everything up, including taking over Shyish and killing Nagash at one point. Uh, but he came back, because of course he did. Um, but the thing was... Nagash realizes something about chaos, and that is that the chaos realms and the chaos gods, they only exist because the they are manifestations of the thoughts and feelings of mortal races. So, you know, you've got Korn, who is anger and violence, you've got Zeech, who is It took him that fucking long to realize it. Holy (laughs) shit. But the thing is, he realized at that point, he's like, well, see... Chaos can only exist if the mortals also exist and have free will. If I kill everyone and bring them back as my own subjects, chaos technically will no longer exist, and so everything will be peaceful again. So he comes up with works though. No, but he essentially essentially comes up with the idea that if I become the god of death and kill everyone that I can. I can bring enough forces and weaken chaos enough to beat them and essentially 
free the world from chaos in his own twisted way. Now, don't hmm. get me wrong, it's a terrible plan, but it's at least a plan, I suppose. But yeah, anyway. it makes sense, I guess. But anyway, for your uh, for your relation to Arkan and Neferata, um, they became what are called Mortarks. Now, Mortarks existed in Warhammer Fantasy as well, as essentially when Nagash was resurrected for the final time, he selected a bunch of undead people uh, who he wanted to become sort of uh, aspects of him, or essentially they do his will in certain ways. For example, um, Harkon, the uh, the head of the Vampire Coast, became uh, a Mortark. Funnily enough, he became a Mortark because he thought it would be a fun thing to do, rather than for any actual reason. <laughs> So he became, I can't remember the, his exact title, but he became a Mortark of the Sea, essentially, and essentially controlled the entire, Nage, uh, the entire navy of Nagash. Um, so in Age of Sigmar, when uh, Nagash was resurrected and be uh, betrayed Sigmar and then went on his whole campaign of undeath, he brought back several people that he knew from uh, the fantasy world and essentially made them as Mortarks again. And the Two that are that you know of at the time are Neferata and Arkan. But there is also three others. So there is also Manfred von Karstein, um, the last von Karstein that existed before the world was destroyed. He became a Mortark as well, but funnily enough, he became a Mortark uh out against his own will because he betrayed Nagash at the very last moment, so he's essentially stuck in his service forever. There's a... Uh, oh, what the hell is their name? All I just have a question. Oh, go ahead. What is the point of Age of Sigma? The point was essentially to transition Warhammer Fantasy to high fantasy, because Age of Sigmar is not or like a fan high fantasy. Though. No, 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 like high fantasy because age of sigmar isn't like uh, a fantasy world where there's elves and dwarves and they all exist in meadows and mountains and stuff in age of sigmar all of the worlds are s separate planes of reality and they are all completely crazy worlds of existence like as i mentioned shyish is a world that is just the representation of death from every single culture in existence so you've got like uh, Norsemen uh, Valhalla type deals and then you've also got Nagash's tombstone city. Like Moor's Garden and, and... Yeah. So yeah. as a result, it's it's very much, and, and the as forces fight in this world by literally popping to different planes of reality and as you might imagine, that makes um, the, the fantasy aspects of it very, very extreme. Uh, and magic is very much a prevalent feature, rather than a normal Warhammer, where magic is sort of a dangerous force that isn't used very often. Uh, in Age of Sigmar, it's used a lot because the whole realm is made of magic. Um, and, hmm. uh, and, Sigmar yeah. and Sigmar himself is a physical presence that exists and fights alongside his forces. Uh, and so including... basically, the God Emperor of Mankind is uh, actually alive in this one. Yes, basically. Um, okay. And, and has his own version of the Space Marines, who are... Oh my god, what the hell is their names? One second, I will look it up. Uh, the Stormcast Eternals, isn't it? <laughs> yes, the Stormcast Eternals. Uh, so yes, back to the more... Um, there's all Olinder, I think is their name, who is the head of, like, a group of... Um, uh, purely ghost like undead called the night haunt um and right. then and then there's the the coolest of the mortarks in my opinion and head of the coolest faction uh who's known as orpheon catacross and he's like uh uh he looks a bit like an undead uh roman frankenstein basically uh <laughs> what the fuck he, can somebody me, please show let, you a picture I, I I, let me find a picture of him hold on an undead Roman Frankenstein. Uh, let me find a picture of him on his throne. He looks really. Oh God! Cool. I'm just I'm, I'm just picturing like super swole undead Frankenstein Julius Caesar, and there he's just there screaming about how democracy doesn't work. Hey, uh -huh. that's that's, ca that's Catacross there. 
Um, nice. Oh, oh right. So oh, I, okay. I'm, I'm about to say a big, big thing here, which is going to be quite controversial. I really like Age of Sigmar for its undead representation. And that's not something you'll hear a lot. A lot of things okay. people will say they hate are Age of Sigmar. I like Age of Sigmar for the undead representation alone. Because See, for the- me, for me, like for the undead in Age of Sigmar, the, to me, they sort of look cool and they look all right. But it's the thing is, is that they just seem a bit... Mm, I want to say a bit much, but I mean, the thing is, is that with Warhammer, everything's a bit much. It's just that with this one, it's especially just the bit... hats. Oh, okay, it's, it's all it's a bit the much. Hat <laughs> is, it's the sash that is made entirely out of skin. It is the fact that their bodies look like bone armor, yet. How, the, how does the fucking bone armor work? Like, well, what, what are they skinned I, to make I can, like, oh, I, oh, I, I can I give you information about that. From this beast. I can give you information about that. So. Uh, oh god! Basically, uh, Nagash is the god of death and controls one of the main four factions of uh, the of the the world of Age of Sigmar. So there's the Order faction who work with Age of Sigmar, which are your humans, your elves, and your dwarves. Uh, you've got the I can't remember what their name is, but you've got what are essentially the green skin factions who comprise of the green skin oh, elves, and you've yeah. got the ogres and such, and who abide by Mork and Gork. You've got are Mork Chaos. And Gork actually alive in this and actually doing stuff. Mork and Gork are actual gods in this. They're not no, physical. I mean, I mean, like, uh, they're are, not are like they physical like, presences. The... Oh, oh, okay. They're not physical presences, but they oh. do exist, and they're separate entities. <laughs> Which is bizarre because a lot of 40k make the joke that they're not, but whatever. You've got Chaos, who are Chaos, and then you've got the Legions of Nagash, who are the the fourth big faction. And the different factions of the of the Legions of Nagash are the Death Lords, and Death Lords are basically your standard groups of necromancers, basically the fantasy um the fantasy troop composition, uh, but in Age of Sigmar, so you've got skeleton warriors, zombies, and necromancers controlling them, zombie dragons and stuff. You've what got... the fuck is that? What, what is what? What, the picture what I showed the you? What is that? What is that? Let me... Let me... Like, okay, okay, high off the high off hats were... were okay, in... in, in oh. They were fine. What the fuck is that? Like, oh, that's... That's that's elves. <laughs> Can you imagine shit. like them trying to get through a doorway or something? <laughs> it's fine. It's it's all physical manifestations of magic. Doors don't exist here. <laughs> and See, this this reminds me this reminds me so much of like Majesty and like fucking Arcanum, um, or whatever the fuck it was called, like uh, so Warlock, Master of the Arcane. Yeah, it's quite extreme. Again, oh, it's it's oh, very hard. High fantasy, which is why a lot of people don't like it. Um, yeah, because it's just like okay. Yeah, so you've got the Death Lords, who are just your standard necromancer things, and they make up the bulk of the uh, of the legions of Nagash. So you've got them. You've got the Flesh Eater Courts, who are wondrous. They are the best way I can describe them. Britonia, um, <laughs> basically. Right. Basically, uh, they're a combination of Bretonia and the Strigoi vampire lines, where um, when they, when these undead were brought into being, this is essentially the ghoul faction, where the ghouls are all as they might look. They're they look like ghouls and they look like giant undead monstrosities that look like big green monsters, but they all think they're nobility. Um, and they all act completely like a normal Bretonian uh, kingdom. So they act all fancy and like, oh, yes, sir, I'll have some of your lovely mead. Oh, you're so quick. Oh. And they all talk about how they want to have lots of yummy dinners and meat and all that stuff and enjoy their, their oh, what is the big one they use? Uh, mutton, that's it. If you... Their speciality is mutton, and if you eat their mutton, you'll be able to join with them. Turns out, okay. they're they're all completely insane, and they're all cannibals, and they're consuming human flesh. And the mutton is just human flesh, and as soon as you eat it, you become a cannibal and thus become a ghoul. 
okay, okay. So, question. So, so we've established that this is in, like this is so high fantasy that you can't get any higher, right? Um, and we've established that they're in like different planes of reality, and magic is fucking everywhere. And the for, and for some reason, all of the every single uh, designer and cloak maker in the in the world has gone insane as well, judging by these fucking hat designs. Um, so all of that is established, but we still have populations in these places. We still have things like mutton and and stuff like that, which means so surely there's got to be like livestock in other places. So how in the goddamn fuck do they manage their populations with all of the constant war going on? Very difficultly. The the Sigmar realms are mostly calm, but they're in constant war because it's Warhammer. Because <laughs> that's their thing. Um, the, actually, the, the legions and the gas are interesting with their regard to human populations. They do exist. Um, most of them are just subjugated under Nagash and think and, and view him as their one true god. But there's uh, unique factions, which I will get into in just a few minutes, which are very uniquely dealing with uh, um, these new factions. By the way, I hope you're all enjoying all this new necromantic uh, content from Age of Sigmar. This podcast should be renamed to the Warhammer Age of Sigmar yeah. <laughs> podcast. Oh. Well, by the way, say about in Age of Sigmar and shit on it. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, is is the Human Rictus Clan one of those factions you're talking about? Because I found that one pretty interesting. The Human the Rictus Clan. The Human Rictus. Yeah, yeah. There's okay. little known. Just- everyone thinks I'm full of shit, but if you read the Rules of the Dead book, there is a human clan called the Rictus Clan that worship Nagash. Oh, yeah. And um. They have like an interesting kind of necromancy because it's voluntary. So, um, oh. yes, I know. Yeah, about, yes. I love. Yes, I it, love how the. I love how the only possibly legitimate voluntary necromancy is the one that is so underdone that nobody knows it, it exists. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. Why? Why is it that so many necromancers in Warhammer are just vicious, horrible cunts? Like, can't we just have one person who specializes with the dead and just like actually is a decent? Like it, they could just be honourable. They could just be striving towards a goal and and doing fucky like necromantic things to achieve that. But they can still have like a sense of honour and they can still have like um morals that they hold close to. Like, like, but no, we can't have any of that. It's gonna be death, suffering, destruction. I'm evil. I want to be a god. Now I'm a god. I want to be the god of everything. That's because it's Warhammer. It's it's grim dark. That's why. <laughs> Yeah. Grim dark has to be dark and edgy because that's its thing. That's why we like it. And um, so yes, oh, go ahead. Can we talk about the vampire sex just for a moment, like the the oh. different bloodlines and whatever? Absolutely. So like, there's the Lamian ones. There's the wolf ones. I think they're the Carsteins, right? There's wolf, yeah, wolf ones. <laughs> Yeah, there's the some. Um, they they have animal transformations. Yes. Oh right. In the books of Empire Wars, they're always shifting into some kind of wolf form, and mm. um, they dislike the the Lamians for some reason. Like, there's some kind of like it was something to do with their like who they descended from that had like disagreements, something like that. Jinx might know more. Uh, hey, hey mainly- guys, you want to turn into animals and fuck each other? What? No. Okay, we hate you. <laughs> well, the Lamians are the, the the only vampire faction that isn't into a war Warhammer, and that's because they are focused on espionage and uh, not fighting on the front line compared to all the mm. others. And I think they don't like each other just for the fact that none of the vampire clans like each other, and the Lamians in particular are not liked because they, well, they have secret agents placed everywhere and do their best to control the population without actually doing any fighting and so that's kind of it. something else about vampires when i was reading the vampire um wars books basically there were certain vampires that didn't want to become vampires like typically um good people that were unwillingly infected and one of them in particular i've forgotten his name the the leader of some kind of order of people that are fighting against the Carstines and all that. But he 
refuses to drink human blood and he just drinks animal blood and he gets by on this but he's sort of like weakened and stuffed by it um do you know who i'm talking about that is that the red duke that sounds like the red duke i'm actually not sure it could be because i know that he was against uh Sylvania and was originally Bretonian, but then he got transformed and then took a whole bunch of Bretonian knights with him and then became a sort of own little vampire cabal. I'm not sure if that's the Red Duke or not, though. Yeah. Let me. Maybe I can look it up. See, you guys talk. These, I'm looking at these cow headed, like these cow hat wearing elf motherfuckers. One, I'm just thinking about the weight of the hats. Two, I'm just thinking about how these look so similar to uh, what the fuck is it called? Eldar in 40k. Like, that's, I, yeah, that's kind of what they went for. <laughs> yeah, like, I was going to say, because it's like I, every time I look at Sigma, like Age of Sigma, I just think to myself, yeah, this just looks like 40k, but fantasy. Yeah, that's kind of what they were going for. I'll tell you more about the other uh, factions of the undead in Age of Sigma once we've gotten past this. Mm. Uh, once we've got past this topic. Um, suffice it to say, as I said, I actually really like the undead factions of Age of Sigmar. They're really... One in particular, which I'll save the best for last, because it's by far the most interesting. But uh, Bloodlines, I think, are a, an interesting way to kind of make vampires more diverse in Warhammer, I suppose. It's a shame that okay. uh, when it comes to necromancy, unfortunately, the the only main ones that are known for it are um, the Necrarchs and sometimes the Von Karsteins, but it's mostly a uh, just general blanket thing rather than something that's specialized in. But I suppose that's just depending on those who like certain types of magic within those bloodlines, I suppose. Like, uh, Manfred was a big necromancer and in fact had a book owned by Nagash, which is why he became so strong. By the way, um, I was really amazed when I was reading through the Vampire Wars. It's how quickly the von Karstein uh, Vlad guy gets killed off. I was like, holy shit, he was around for five minutes, now he's already gone. Yeah, Vlad, fu- Vlad's funny because if he, was, uh, if he was allowed to live longer, he would be easily the strongest creature in Warhammer just for the fact he has a ring that literally means he can't die. He will come back immediately afterwards. There's a funny story. So you mean to tell me he's got the the one ring? Uh, well, not even that. Like this ring alone is the thing that keeps him alive. But like the one ring allows you to be resurrected. But this ring literally lets him had his head cut off. Everyone cheered at the fact his head was cut off, and then the next day he just reappears with his head back on. Bizarre thing. But anyway, yeah. So uh, there's a funny story with him how he lost a battle against. Uh, a force and then one of his vampire underlings uh, took the opportunity to quickly kill him while his back was turned and then tried to claim uh, Isabella his wife as his own and then started addressing the rest of the undead forces as I'm going to take charge and I'm going to be brilliant etc etc and then Vlad literally walked through the crowd (laughs) alive and well with his head reattached and then just killed him on stage immediately I was going to say, like, how would you go about doing this? Like, I claim Isabella is my wife. I heard she gives the good suck. Oh, because it's <laughs> very much the old belief of, oh, the, the, I can only be head of you if there's king and queen, and now she's my queen because I say All so. right. Isn't she more powerful than the guy, though? Like, surely. No. Well, she's, she's animalistic. She's very much where the, the whole uh, shifting into wolf thing comes from because she's very much a hunter while as Vlad oh okay a... so, so that explains why Vlad in Total War 2 looks like he's had his uh, fucking nose bitten off <laughs> poor Vlad he used to be so pretty uh, but he's much more of a knight doing battle and armor and stuff while she's more of a animalistic type of vampire I can't find this guy's name, unfortunately, but he was some kind of, like, leader of an order of knights, unwillingly turned into a vampire, and then he just goes on to only drink animal blood, and, like, he tries to kill the the other vampires, basically. Mm. Well, he's got a big disadvantage, so because of the animal blood. Yeah, it somehow makes him weak. Mm. Okay. 
I think it might be the Red Duke, but I'm not sure. Um, um isn't the law behind like Vlad and Isabel, Isabella, Isabel, Isabella? Isabella um, isn't the law literally that they like hooked up together when they was younger or some shit, and then Vlad came in, killed her dad. She swooned because she was into that kind of thing. So Vlad scooped her off her feet and then basically just took over her dad's estate. Uh, something even like funnier, that. Even funnier than that, uh, her uncle was going to inherit the von Karstein name and thus the entirety of Sylvania because her dad was on death's door. Her dad tried to get as many bachelors as he could so that she could gain control over Sylvania and that her uncle wouldn't gain control. Because yes, what you're thinking is correct. Her uncle decided he wanted to have her as his wife. Creepy as hell. But anyway. Yeah, but I mean that's pretty standard though when it comes to stuff like this. Isn't it? <laughs> I mean like I mean like look at look at Henry the Air, for example. He was given to his dead brother's wife when he himself was a kid and the widow was a mature woman. Yeah. So that uh, a whole bunch of people came to try and win her hand and all of them were scared scared and frightened off by how animalistic she was. And this is before she became a vampire. And, and this is before she became a vampire. And then Vlad strolled in out of bloody nowhere, and then went and killed their uncle because Isabella asked him to do so. And then she said, I want to marry this guy. And then they, that, then they got married. And that's how he became the ruler of Sylvania for a time. And something oh, really weird about well, those why two. Why did you choose this particular person? He looks like he's been dragged through about five forests to hell and back. Oh, you know, I just like his personality. <laughs> and, uh... Well, that's because that's because the model <laughs> Total War Warhammer 2 ruined him. He was supposed to be very pretty, but unfortunately the model of Total War Warhammer 2 was not that. <laughs> Something really weird about those two is they seem to be genuinely in love, which is strange for vampires. Yeah, I do like that. I do really like that about them. Especially, like, how on, on the campaign and map and shit, it's like, as long as they're together, they work together. Like, they work well together. So you're incentivized to have them together with one another, backing one another up. And I, I really, really do like that. Yeah, they're, they're meant to be psychopaths, but they're psychopaths that love each other. So that's... They're, they're, there's, they, they literally go along the line of there is no one in this world who is like me because I'm completely depraved and psychopathic but you do, so you are my one true love, and that's how their love story sort of blossoms. You reminded me of characters in my fucking world now, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, can you please tell us all about Heinrich Kemmler? Because I don't know a damn thing about him aside of what Warhammer Total War has shown me. I oh, Kemmler. Kemmler is the OG Warhammer bad guy. He was the first ever proper antagonist in Warhammer. Um, like he he was like the one of the biggest threats the Empire ever had, wasn't he? Like in, yes. in Total Warhammer 2, he's depicted as a grumpy old man with a guy called Krell who follows him around. But like in, in the law, he's meant to be this massive fucking threat that like he, like a proper nearly like didn't he nearly take out the Empire by himself? Yes, that's correct. So basically, he was a he was a, well he was a, a typical necromancer route. He was a dude. He got access to a scary book that his father told him not to read. He read it, and then at that point, he decided he wanted to live forever, and so he became a necromancer. Nothing exciting, but anyway, he he was the main antagonist, the only named antagonist of first edition Warhammer Fantasy. And he was well known for being the big bad guy at the time, before any of the rest of Warhammer had properly been uh, developed, I suppose. And so now he's like just a grumpy old guy because he's he's not as the big bad guy anymore because now that's Nagash and stuff. But he was wait, what, known. Wait, wait, wait. What does? Didn't he die during End Times? Like, can, like if he's back he in, did. if he is he back in Age of Sigma? He's not, unfortunately. No. That is but a fucking waste. In a just. But he did die during uh, uh, end times because Wait. he had a fight what? with Arkan uh, Ar by... Essentially, Heinrich made a deal when he lost all his power with the Chaos Gods to become their avatar. And so he worked with Arkan to find Nagash's staff. 
And then when they were going to bring it back to Nagash, he then went, you fool, I am actually an agent of the Chaos Gods. And then he was going to take that back to them so that they could use it to kill Nagash. Oh, yeah. And, and fight. the fight, the fight. Okay, you know how like in Harry Potter, how like Harry Potter and Voldemort have like that laser beam fight with one another, where they're clutching their thick throbbing ones very hard at one another with that, with that fucking ooze coming out of it and like meeting in the middle. Imagine that, except it's between a guy who's dead and a guy who's on the verge of being dead. <laughs> Like, enough, like, though, like, like, like two old men just, just grabbing <laughs> the... Yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, though, uh, he actually didn't lose to Nagash. What happened was he filled himself with so much power using Nagash's staff that he blew himself up. That's how he died. He died in the end times by blowing himself up due to having too much power. Also, this is, uh, this is in the business, we would call this foreshadowing, but this is actually after shadowing. I don't even know if this is a fucking term. This is after shadowing because he's been, um, hasn't he been nerfed a lot on tabletop, like since first edition? Like he's been nerfed and nerfed and nerfed and nerfed down. Probably. I, I'm not uh, too familiar with tabletop myself, so I wouldn't know, but that sounds probably right. So it's literally the case where he's, too pa- he's so powerful that he becomes weak. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. By the way, if I may interject just for one moment, do you guys think it's a total waste how, like, um, Kemla is kind of implemented as just, like, a standard vampire count dude? I think he should have awesome chaos minions and stuff because he's also, like, gotten power from chaos, right? That would make I guess, him very like, fundamentally, he's a necromancer that uses necromancy and the lore, and the lore of death and all that. Like, Krell is a champion of chaos that does serve um, Kemla, but... I kind of feel that with how their mechanics are, it would be... I mean, there is a mod that turns Kemler into like a horde faction and whatnot, but the problem with horde factions in Total War is that they're fucking shit. <laughs> so, I mean, it's bad enough that... I mean, it's, it's, Kemler is kind of okay, but he's not a good lord. To, like, 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 the vampire cats easily blow him out of the water, like the other ones. Not, not Gorst, but the, but the actual vampire ones blow him out of the water easily. So if they made him any worse and turned him into a horde faction, then nobody would just play him at all as is. He but, had his um, own faction back in the day, but you're right, he did get just sort of bundled into vampire counts, unfortunately, even though he has nothing to do with them. Yeah, I think he should just be a bit more unique somehow. Also, fun uh, fact, uh, Krell um, is actually one of Nagash's Mortarks, one of his chosen uh, during the end times. <laughs> so Krell comes back but Kemla doesn't okay then yeah. oh, no no he doesn't come in Age of Sigmar this is during the end times Krell straight up just abandons Kemler and becomes a Mortark oh. of Nagash oh so his, his own unique bodyguard even leaves that's so messed oh. up dude yeah I'm um, just kind of like imagining this because it, uh, of how petty Sigmar is during this because Okay, okay, so Sigma, like, he brings every, like, he clicks his fingers and brings everybody back, which it's, it's, for me, that just really annoys me, but, okay, but he, he, he does that, so he brings back Nagash, okay, okay, you know, like, like, this guy's caused so much suffering and problems, and he's going to betray us anyway, but we need to bring him back, because, you know, we're going to bring back this person, and this person, and we need to bring back, uh, the, the, the fucking orcs as well, and, fuck it, we're, we're bringing everyone back, well, that Kemler, fuck him. Yeah, just, like, don't bring back the coolest necromancer. Who needs that? Born Kemler. Just so petty. Can we talk about Herman Gorst or Helman Gorst or whatever his name is? Because he's a pretty <laughs> <laughs> interesting <laughs> character. Gorst, like, like can we make it into an actual product that oh, Herman yeah. makes? I thought it was Herman, but someone wrote Helman <laughs> here. Wait, which one is it? It's Helman. <laughs> is it? Oh, fuck. Yes, it is. It's Helman. Poor hell. Oh, Gorst. Gorst, Gorst is a standard necromancer who just sort of got put in as a character because eh, he's the, yeah, isn't he literally just an edge like his whole thing is just that he's a stereotypical edge lord. He's an he's a necrom he's the necromancer lord for Manfred von Karstein, and his story mm. is that he was a messenger in the empire who was delivering a message out somewhere, and when he came back, there was a plague going on that the Skaven had released, which had killed his whole family, including his uh, three brothers and his father. And that upset him greatly. Mm. And so 
naturally, as you do, he turned to the dark powers of necromancy to try and bring them back. <laughs> and as you might know, that didn't work. So instead, he wandered the land as a necromancer after getting uh, chased down by the witch hunters. And then he was discovered by Manfred, who thought he had potential and then brought him in. And that's his character. And now he's mental and has his brothers and his father carry his uh, himself around on a chariot, which is a corpse cart. Uh, I got another question just about the necromancers in general. So, like, why are they all fucked up kind of homeless looking hobo guys? Because uh, the winds of Dar and the winds of necromancy are corrupting on your body. They're like, um, they're like, uh, they drain your power away because they're very close to pure chaos energy. And chaos energy is just like mutation energy. And so because of that, that's why... <laughs> They look so decrepit and die yeah. dead. As well. What I want to know, like even in Warhammer Fantasy, what I really, really want to know, how do any of them manage to survive as they do, looking like they haven't had a shower in ten thousand years? If you look at <laughs> all of them, like like Kemna himself has got like a cloak made out of skin from people, and fa he's got like faces and shit in his fucking cloak and whatnot. And you look at all of the, like, you've got young, the, the young necromancers and whatnot, and they just look like edgelords that come straight out of college. Like, that have got no other, uh, that don't want to go into the Empire, and they've got no other life goals to go into. You look at the old ones, and they look like they're just two inches away from dying. How do they not die of diseases or anything like that sooner. Like, like with what they do, the hygiene is out of the window. You should be able to smell them be before they're within 10 miles radius of you. And you should be able to just poke them and they should just fucking fall over because of all the diseases riddling their bodies. I love how messed up they are. No, that's, how, that's why they're one of the weakest hero units in the game. <laughs> Fair enough. Man, I love how they look. They're so f messed up. It's brilliant. Um, well, it's it's like when I was playing as um, a Heinrich Kemmler in my campaign. That was the only um, campaign I did for the vampire counts. But I basically had the entire world subjugated by like a, a horde of hobos. Because that's what they look like. <laughs> And I only used necromancers. I didn't really use the vampires much. I just had like a gigantic, endless army of hobos. It was great. So it literally, it's a murder hobo campaign. Yeah. Very much. <laughs> and Damn it's funny when you. Sorry. What? I was just gonna. It's funny when you watch them in combat because they just sit there like shaking their swords, kind of going like. Aah. Oh, but it's, I bet they are. Yeah. <laughs> um. What I was going to say for, like, the necromancers is why do they have to... Like, out of anything that they could go as, they specifically, like, it, I feel like they spend so much time on the presentation that it's actually admirable and cute in a way. Like, I can just imagine, like, a bunch of, like, necromancers in this, in this ramshackled house Teaching and and like need and so sort of teaching each other how to like make the these really edgy, cool looking costumes that they're gonna wear, and and then they're gonna like have like group projects and like um like like school sort of things that they do to sort of like look the part, and then they go out and then they just have like a bunch of like romance fun killing people. <laughs> hey, you gotta have sewing circles somewhere. Why not have human flesh sewing circles? It's it's like it's like on that picture especially. It's like, it's like. Yeah, the guy, the guy, he looks, he reminds me so much of Prince Philip. But it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like <laughs> the stuff that he's wearing. So not only has he gone out of his way to get the fur for the mane, but he's also gone out of his way to get like the bones and to, and to stitch like the leather around them and to do it in this complicated pattern and design. Like, I feel like the only reason as to why the necromancers haven't taken over the world is because they're too busy doing their eyeshadow and they're way too busy like making themselves <laughs> look proper for when they do take over the world. So no, they, they never actually get to doing it because they don't look as good as they want to be. Well, duh. Can't take over the world if you don't look fabulous while doing it. Right? <laughs> By the way, yeah. one more question, if you don't mind. I don't know anything about the origins of the Vampire Coast and all that. How do they come about? Um, 
Aren't they literally just like a meme faction? Like, they, aren't they, that just got added into the game and everybody enjoyed that? Uh, they got started by Harkon, who who was insane and said, I don't want to be a vampire anymore, I want to be a pirate, and so he did become a pirate. <laughs> And then from there he's what is with the fucking name Harkon? Uh, Luther Harkon. He's, he's like, so great. I love him. I, know, I mean, I know, I know, like his name, but what is with the name Harkon? Like, 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 where does that originate from? God knows. I think it's a really cool name. Also, I think I think of the the vampire lord from Skyrim whenever I say his name. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's like it's in Skyrim. It's 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 in. Warhammer. It, it's just it feels like it's in so many places. Like there's got to be a thing for it somewhere. Probably. It's got a very vampiric sounding name. He's great. I love it when you click him in game and he goes like Lufo Harkon. <laughs> he's a complete wackaloon. Well, he's got eight personalities in his head, and they're yeah. all completely separate. Oh, he's so wonderful. I love that guy. Indeed. If you would like, I can tell you about the other um, undead factions of Age of Sigmar, if you'd like. Yeah. I've only told you about two of them. So Let's do that. So uh, can I ask a very important question? Go ahead. Do the Vampire Coast come in Age of Sigmar? Nope. Okay, we're cancelling GW. <laughs> They're, they're a very minor faction in the tabletop. The only reason why they're so beloved in to War Warhammer is because a whole bunch of new units were given to them for the game. Because in the actual oh, right. tabletop, I don't think they had much at all. I don't think they had much lore behind them either. Um, but yes, so there is three more undead sub-factions in Age of Sigmar. <clears throat> So I've told you about the uh, the Death Lords. I've told you about the Flesh Eater Courts. There is the Night Haunt, who are a essentially the ghost faction, which comprise the spirits, comprise of ghosts, banshees, and uh, mortis engines and things like that. They're all based around non-corporeal undead, um, and thus they make very good spies, very good... Uh, very good... Uh, See, I do assassins, I, things like that. I do remember sort of seeing. Let me try and find it. But there was a trailer. There was a trailer for like the um, for the Ghosty Boys in Age of Sigmar, and it had one of the most convoluted designs I think I've ever seen for a spectral undead. Which was that? Um, let me try and let me try and find it. It was the one where there was announcing like a new tabletop unit or a character or hero. Um, and like they did like a little animation for it, and it came out like in this graveyard. And where is it? 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 I think the Night Haunt are the one I'm least familiar with, just because I think of them as just ghosts and not much else. But uh, I'm willing to be proven wrong on that. I don't know. Um. One of the, the the fourth faction of the undead are the Soul Blight, and the Soul Blight are vampires. They're vampires trademark. <laughs> um, the va- the Soul Blight curse is just vampirism, and the only difference between the the zap- vampires and the Soul Blight is that the Soul Blight are divided up via. Um, via dynasties rather than bloodlines so it's not like you are your uh, cre- uh, abilities and stuff are determined by who your your progenitor is it, it's who you're sided with and who your faction is that determines what your abilities are um, there are three of them which are really interesting the first one I can't remember the name of it in fact I can't remember the name of either of them there's three of them, but one of them is a dynasty that focuses around transforming into animalistic monsters, um, and specifically based around like a bit like von Karstein's, where they're a bit based around wolves and stuff. But this is like 
not just wolves, this is full-blown like werewolves and stuff. So it's like a werewolf-vampire hybrid faction. So there's that. There's another one which is a um, one that's based off of mutation um, and like changing their forms into big, weird vampiric monstrosities, which I can't remember the name of. Let me take a look. Um, I found the thing. It was a cru cru. I'm going to butcher this. Cruel gas cruciator. Cruel gas cruciator. It's in yeah. It's in the private uh, podcast channel. It's um, it's the one where he has basically been like crucified. Oh but, yes. Oh I, yeah. Yeah, I and it's you're so yeah. terribly like I get it, but it's just so convoluted. Like why? Um. It looks cool, but why? Well, you think that's cool, but why? Well, the, this uh, vampire faction that's based on mutation, this is their ultimate form uh, when, they want oh, to, when they want to reach the apex of their abilities, is this lovely looking fella, who is like a vampire centaur hybrid, and is cool as shit. <laughs> that is pretty awesome. So, How the fuck does that fly? Uh, <laughs> don't question. Um, How? So there's that, and then there's a, there's a third faction who are very cool. The third faction are based on the blood dragons, um, in that they're a knightly order of vampires who ride around in cavalry and stuff. But the really cool thing about them is not their abilities, because they're just knights, but it's what they do. Um... Basically, they are centered around a thing called the Crimson Fortress, which is basically a vampire stronghold, a, a castle that can teleport. And this is like where in uh, uh, Ages of Old, where people would talk about misty, mysterious castles appearing in the ruins of old, where this castle will literally take over old ruined castles and like form themselves in that place. And then this faction of soul blight vampires would come out of the this teleporting castle and ravage the land nearby and then the castle would disappear as quickly as it appeared so and the thing is them and their leader is bound to the castle so they can't technically leave the area of the castle so the castle just teleports around to compensate which is a cool concept I'm just looking at the model, and I just... <laughs> okay, it's like, I understand it if he turned into that. I understand it if he was a mix of the two. I understand it if it was some kind of, like, maybe they got mutated and merged with something else. Like, I, I can understand that there's a lot of ways that they can go about it. Why the fuck did they go with this? Here's another one. It's, it's, the same, it's the creation. It's awesome. I can't remember what the mutation's name is, though, unfortunately. It's a shame, because it's really cool. Maybe I'll... It, how does it do anything like that? Because they're heavily based on mutation. They, they give in to mutation. I know, but like they could do so much more with it. I mean, like my vampires, I've got all kinds of weird shit with them, but you don't see them looking like these motherfuckers. Yeah, but, you know, it's Warhammer, so it's got to look cool, and such and such. I uh, mean, like, like, if they remove the wings, and if they, like, um, had, like, wings coming out of the back, sort of like a sphinx, and if they instead added, like, maybe some, like, claws, or, like, a, like a, another pair of, of legs for the front, and they had, and, like, they could kind of, like, mix in the Egyptian with the um, Eastern European themes to kind of, like, have some kind of vampiric... Uh, vampire Sphinx, right? A, vam a vampire centaur Sphinx, or some shit like that. Like that would, I feel like that would work better than that, because I'm just imagining it flying, and I'm having so much difficulty trying to picture. Like, like, is the front bit? Does the front bit sort of like soar through the sky? Like, you know how like Superman horizontally flies? Yeah. Yeah. Does it do that when it's flying, or does the shoot, or does like the vampire part, um, actually sit upright 
as it flies. I don't even know if it flies. I just know that it's got that what? centaur-esque look to it. Uh, yeah, it should fly because it's got wings. I don't know. Uh, by the way, its name, I figure out, is a bit... The, the name of reaching this state is called being a Vingorian Lord, apparently. So there you go. So, <laughs> That's that. cool. So, it's, it, so when they attack, it's the Venga hour. And guys, we're about out of time. It's been an hour and a half. Oh no, oh. can I tell about the one last faction and then we can, we can call sure. it Sure. Okay. All right. The last one is my favorite one. And the last one are the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. And these are Nagash's Space Marines. And that sounds insane. <laughs> that sounds insane, but hear me out. So okay. I showed you Catacross earlier. The, the, the dude that looks like a bone-like Frankenstein's monster. Really he, is the head, yeah, yeah, yeah. he is the head of this faction. You were telling me, oh, he looks like he's made out of bone. How on earth does that work? How does he look like all of that? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Well, this is a faction that is entirely composed of bone constructs. How they work is they are the elite military fighting force of Nagash's Legion. Um, they essentially right. act as uh, they are create they they are created a bit like bone robots essentially. They're these constructs that are created out of pure bone that are forged out of different pieces, and then they form soldiers. And then um, what they are what are called soul forges are used to split apart the different souls of the people that are in Shaiish. And they take the best elements out of all of them. So, for example, they take the best warriors and they take out their courage, their military prowess and their strength and throw away things like their compassion or their want for needing to do anything as such. And then they put all of them inside of these units in order to make them basically uh, skeleton space marines. Um, Can you, you share with us a picture of them, please? And also, how does the... How did? What the fuck? Okay. I'll send you a few of them. They are very cool because they are easily the strongest undead units that he has available to him, um, and they are directly in response to the Stormcast Eternals, which use a similar kind of system. Um, this is a very interesting kind of looking image for them as well, which kind of shows how they're created. Okay, how do they? Okay, how? Okay, so you said that they get the bone and they. Do what with it to make it like this? They literally use it like a material, like you would make a like you would make a robot. You you, you instead of using metal to form a, an exoskeleton and then power it up, they use bone to do it instead, and then animate the bone and use the souls in order to animate them. So high fantasy necrons then. But literally, yeah, they're basically high fantasy necrons, but they're forged from the souls of loads of different kinds of people but instead. That's not how bone works, though. It does when you're in high fantasy, baby. Um, <laughs> and they have, they have loads of different variations of them as well. Not just warriors, they also have um, different like priests whose jobs are to actually create the bone reapers, or whose jobs are, while on the battlefield, to like uh, pick up the souls of the dead and then store them in containers for later. Um, and you've also got the the big guys, who if I can find a picture of, um, I can't remember its name, but they're basically like bone constructs or bone golems, and they're like giant monsters that crush enemies, and then they pick up the bones and material that are left over and then store them for later. Ah, here's one. Here's one. But... So yeah, this is the this oh, is the wow. big guy. Yeah, the really okay. Cool. Now that I do like the design of that. That looks like an absolutely that looks like a proper undead abomination right there. I like it there's too. A whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of different. Ones. Uh, there's this lovely fella who's like one of the uh, priest guys whose job is to create them. Um, and they're Every all. Every single time I look at these, I'm just thinking of the amount of hours spent actually painting the fuckers. Oh, I. But they're essentially supposed to be the elite force. Um, oh, there's also this dude who is wonderful, uh, who is like the head of the forces uh, when they're on the battlefield. And he has a bone chair who <laughs> walks on its own. <laughs> it's wondrous. 
This uh, way, like the hat, the chair, this. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's anybody, like a mini Nagash. Have you ever seen. Yeah, if literally. You've, you know, if you've seen, like, uh, if the Emperor had the text to speech device, what the fuck is his name? You know that guy, the Inquisitor guy? Oh, yes, um, I know who you're talking about, yeah. Who sits. Yeah, this reminds me so much of that. Fair enough. Um, so. Yeah, so that's that. They're the elite force, and they're very cool, and they're very strong as well. And they have loads of different variations of them, and they are basically, like 40k and their space marines, they're brought onto the battlefield to deal with the heavy hitters. They're meant to be the big elite fighting force for Nagash. Everything else is just underneath them, and they are in charge. And Katakros, the guy I mentioned earlier, he is basically their leader, and he essentially... Uh, works to keep them doing their job but here's, just... the in here's the interesting thing about them so it's not enough that they are essentially bone robots that are very cool but how they deal with mortals is what's most interesting because they have a thing called the bone tithe so how how it works is when they march to war if they come across a civilian population they don't just kill them what they do is they meet with their leaders and tell them, we are, the, we are the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, we are the Hand of Nagash. Here's what you will do. We will spare your people in ex and, and leave you alone. In exchange, at certain points in time, you will have to bring us a payment of bones. It can be God dead bodies. fucking damn it. It can be dead bodies, it can be animals, whatever, but it needs to be bone. If you bring us enough material and meet your payments on time, then we will do you no harm. And they keep this promise most of the time. And that's kind of what they're based on. So they essentially make more of themselves by collecting raw material, and as long as people adhere to this, then they don't kill them. See, there's a thing like that works similar in my world in, with one of the nations, where it's like they Okay. So, yeah, the, the OCR Bone Reapers are very interesting, and as I mentioned, they're, they were meant specifically to fight the Stormcast Eternal Space Marine bullshit that uh, um, I came up with. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Why is it that every single one of these looks like they've got a lot of detail, they've got a lot of work put into them, yet you go up to the guy who's leading them, and he literally looks like it doesn't look like he's up to the, up to that standard. Uh, presumably because he was created earlier on, he was the first of them, and then the rest oh of them right were okay afterwards okay that makes he sense. Was, he was originally uh, a, a, he was originally a, a, a like a really fancy tribal warlord who died, went to their afterlife, and then Nagash sort of rolled through, and he fought back against Nagash, and he was the only person able to fight back against his forces, and Nagash was so impressed that he offered him a job, and he took it, and now that's why he's like that. I wanted to make a joke about his crotch bit, like the bony crotch bit, it's like, you know, like about him packing bones and whatnot, but... I'm not going to, because reali realistically, like, you'd probably need that just in case some absolute random twat just decides, you know what, I'm going to smack him here. Yeah. But yeah, so that's that's the Legions of Nagash for Age of Sigmar, and I think they're pretty cool. And I know the Age of Sigmar is a lot of people who don't like it, and there are a lot of things that are wrong with it, but I, I really like what they did with Undead. Specifically, I'm just glad that there is an entire faction that is dedicated to undead that isn't vampires. Can I ask a question? Yes. So Nagash rules over the land of the dead, right? Like a plane of a, a plane that is literally just dead, 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 death, death, and yes. more dead. How the fuck does anything grow there? Like, how can they get? Because to get bones, you need people. You need things that are alive, right? So to get those, you need things to make those things stay alive, like food and plant life and animals and shit. Because so, it, it's not just death, it's afterlife. Shyish comprises of everyone's afterlives, and some of those afterlives are good afterlives, like uh, Norsk and Valhalla type deals, or uh, whatever Warhammer equivalent of High Elf Heaven is. 
those exist in Shaiish because they are all equally valid in Shaiish. So there are places that have uh, nice places that are, exist. Um, so if you die, you go to Shaiish, right? Yes. So if you die on a different plane, then you ultimately you will go to this place, right? Your soul will, yeah. Yeah, so your soul goes to that place. Why then have they not taken over? Because they could literally just kill the best people and then use their souls to work against the... And like, it's like, oh, well, you, you, you were the commander of, of our enemies. We're going to use your knowledge and expertise against them. Well, that's what he's trying to do. Not everyone is... Uh, it, is it, not everyone's with Nagash in Shaiish, because Nagash kind of just took over. Um, so unlike every conqueror... He's not exactly liked that much a lot by a lot of people in Shyish. Um, so okay. that's what he, he's currently in the process of doing so, essentially. And his logic is basically um, all souls belong to me because they all come at the end to Shyish. So I'm, I'm the ruler of Shyish, so all of them belong to me. This is going to be my last one. I'm going to try and make this quick. Um, when it comes to Shyish, like if you die and you're in Shyish and you're an undead, in this Ocelot Bone Reapers, whatever the fuck, or, or if you're in like a different group or whatever, where do you go then? Is there like a, a super after afterlife that you go to, or what? Technically, you return to Shyish, but you are just a soul, so you need to be caught again, basically. But you te fuck? technically, he has unlimited troops because it's it's the yeah, because like they they can just recycle their own troops endlessly. Yes. But and, but oh, okay, chaos are a thing. <laughs> And chaos like having undead things as well, so they can sometimes steal souls and take them for themselves as well. So whenever they fight against chaos, it's basically like a big resource war, essentially. Hmm. Right. Interesting. Okay. Right, guys, we should wrap this up. It's been an hour and forty-six minutes. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any final statements or anything like that? I'm um, so sorry for talking about Dangerous Sigmar for so long. I mean, <laughs> okay. I, honestly, like, I, I think uh, you, you've, done, you've done a lot more than me or Cheb could afraid of Sigmar, so. Yeah, I don't know that much about it, but I know more now thanks to Jinx. And it saves us having to learn about Age of Sigmar because fuck that. <laughs> I it gotta is say, interesting. I gotta say that, like, the two books that I read, well, three books, the Age of Sigmar one was the least enjoyable for me. They definitely took a lot away from the narrative perspective, I think, but they made up for the narrative perspective in the, the design aspect, because, like, the models for Age of Sigmar look incredible compared to old Warhammer fans. Um, Chip, how would you say the Age of Sigmar book, com uh, books or book, the one that you've read, compared to the Warhammer one, like the typical Warhammer fantasy ones? I found that, like... like tone and prose and all of that. So what I liked about the the rise of Nagash was that like it seemed more real, like the people had more kind of like real motivations and stuff. Whereas when I was reading Rulers of of the Dead, it was kind of like um, it was just more kind of yeah, it it felt more like destiny and fate and stuff like that. Like people were kind of like. Um, doing what they were doing and they were kind of like not in control of what they were doing because at the end of the oh, day so they gash yeah so they've got no agency they're not yes they want to do it they want to do it because their plot demands that they do it yeah like Neferata and Arkin, for example are kind of like almost puppets of Nagash which it wasn't so cool for me because of reading about them previously they were like they had their own agency and they were their own cool entities whereas in and the rules of the, because of the this choices that they've made yes exactly there's actually an interesting theory surrounding that is that um, Ark uh, Nagash is the one that brought them back but there's a theory that only Sigmar is capable of actually bringing people from the fantasy world back. So there's a theory that the Arcan and Neferata that he brought back are not actually Arcan and Neferata. They're just uh, undead that Nagash made think are Arcan and Neferata because he's actually very lonely and wants this to talk to. <laughs> This would actually make sense because, like, the personalities are also different between the books. Like, it, yeah. it he, even Arkan himself has questions about his own existence because he doesn't remember anything before, uh, 
coming to Shyish with Nagash. So yeah, it's an interesting theory. Yeah, that's another thing I disliked going from that book to, to this book was just like how different those characters were personality wise. <laughs> Um, Neferata is very different in The Rise of Nagash to how she is in Rulers of the Dead, in my opinion. Like, if you read the two books back to back, you'll see what I mean. She was much more kind of emotional, maybe, in The um, Rise of Nagash, for example, you know, kind of like her crazy, irrational kind of um, obsession with that guy and like just stuff like that. She seemed much more like collected in Rules of the Dead. Maybe she just grew up a bit. I don't know. Have you read those books, Jinx? I have not, no, unfortunately. You should definitely read them. I'd say everyone that loves um, necromancy should definitely read The Rise of Nagash. It's probably the best necromancy read I've ever had. It is solid. It's definitely one of the better books for necromancy, that's for certain. Yeah. As long as you love, like, the most evil necromancer ever. I love how he gets rid of his brother. Holy shit. Should I spoiler that? Right, um, go ahead. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I would say, like, spoilers, like, for people that want to sort of save it for themselves to read. I, I, I think, like, all those people should should be gone now, so you can, yeah. you can spoil it. So, basically, he, like, locks his brother in, like, um, a tomb or something and just leaves him there to starve to death and later you find him these like you can see his claw marks and like the fucking walls because he's like scratched his nails down to the bone or something awful like that it was like oh god oh so Nagash is a fan of Edgar Allan Poe okay then just typical evil Warhammer stuff oh and the, mm. the way he like executes people to get their their blood he like puts them in unnecessary suffering to, to get that blood just because he's a dick <laughs> that's Nagash, baby. That should be a sitcom name. That's so Nagash. Who else yeah. but Nagash? Do 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 and do. Ba, ba, it's, ba, ba, ba. it's also unnecessary because he asks the, the dark elves he's learning from, like, does the pain they go through have anything to do with the end result? And they say, like, nah, we just like making him suffer. And Nagash is like, okay, I'll make him suffer <laughs> even more. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Oh, and the vampires are just such sick puppies in general. Holy crap. All right, guys. Thanks for the podcast. It's been really good. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. Bye.